Hi there, this is Shawnee Jebby on Miss USA 1998, and you are listening to Life After the Crown with Tim Tiago. Hey everybody, welcome to the Life After the Crown podcast, where each episode I bring you useful interviews with former pageant contestants, title holders, and women of influence who are now succeeding across many different industries in the real world. My name is Tim Tialdo, lifestyle entrepreneur, pageant host, author, and quite honestly, somebody who just wants to help you become a better person overall. Now, if pageant life is over for you, or it soon could be, and you're wondering, well, what do I do now? Or what's next? This podcast is designed to help make the transition to real life and the school of hard knocks a little bit easier for you to handle. So if this is your first time listening, thanks for tuning in. We're glad you're with us today. Let's get started. My guest today was Miss USA 1998 and placed top five at Miss Universe that same year. She's worked in the television and entertainment industry for more than 20 years, appearing on networks such as ESPN2, DirecTV, Fox Sports, MTV, Disney, The Golf Channel, The Price is Right, and multiple commercials. After being diagnosed with a rare form of Meniere's disease over 20 years ago, she now intentionally shares her journey off hearing loss as a patient advocate. For the past decade, she has traveled the world as an ambassador for early detection of hearing loss and she is currently the official spokesperson for Someone Like You, L3C, and Rare Disease Ambassador for Colorado Rare 501c3. She enjoys being able to connect to people with rare diseases and health conditions, ensuring they don't have to face their challenges on their own. She is married to her hero, who serves on the Denver Police Department, and is a proud mama of three-year-old twins. Sean A. Jebbia, honored to have you on the show today. Thank you so much, Tim. I'm honored to be here. Yeah, really? Well, yeah, no, it's great. Uh, you know, I, I remember watching your pageant back in 1998. I think I was uh, in, I don't know, my junior year of college, and it was, uh, I think that's when Miss USA, if I recall correctly, <laughs> I mean, I know Trump had just taken it over right before that, but that's when the ratings on television really started to go through the roof. It was uh, Allie Landry a couple of years before you, and then, you know, you were in 1998. Now, well, I think what's interesting is I read that Miss Massachusetts USA, which was your state title, that was actually your first attempt at a pageant title. Um, And not only, obviously, did you win state, but you won the whole national competition. So I I guess what made you start competing in the late 90s? That's interesting. Um, I had a friend, Angelina Savage, that was a Miss Florida the year before when Trump came in. And we competed in some fitness modeling together. And she and I became really close. And when she got in this pageant, she she called me up and said, Shani, you got to do this. It's not... It's not so, how could I say, structured in a way that you have to mold yourself to be a pageant person, which I, I had no idea. I mean, Tim, I showed up. <laughs> I still get teased. I showed up in track suits to the, to the rehearsals at Miss USA, okay? We're talking tra- <laughs> like the old school track suits. So, you know, I have a few friends after all these years, like, track suits, on it? You know, but the last three days, I, with, there's no press and there, there are no judges. You're just, it's a lot of energy back then that we weren't really putting into it quite yet. So it was, I felt it wasn't important to be the game on from 6 a.m. Yet that when you go to universe, that that is so. But so I just did whatever. No one knew who I was really until the last three days. And I started wearing cat suits and all this (laughs) and uh, changed my my look a little bit. Everyone, who is that? You know, so um, we just had a lot of fun with it. But Angelina inspired me that I can be myself. I was already working in television, hosting an an international fitness show, um, airing at five days a week on The Juice. You saw that. So I came in a, a collegiate athlete, a scholar athlete. I was already a personal trainer, graduated with honors in college, working in television. So I really looked at this as a way to further my career. Obviously, I was looking at the end picture, not at really the crown and, and you know, so much of being a queen as I was. Wow, this is a great stepping stone. I looked at Halle Berry. I looked at some of them that didn't necessarily win that were who they were. You know, it really was about who they were and what they wanted in life. So I, look at it, I looked at it as that stepping stone. Okay, maybe. Maybe this is going to get me to Los Angeles, get an agent, which it did. I had William Morris once I was the first one to leave with a job in 47 years. Um, Trump was the one to tell me that. I was shocked. You know, my generation was back when J.C. Penney's, we were working in malls, and hopefully at the end we would we would get some sort of career mm-hmm. when we didn't have any skills uh, at that at that point in television going into it. So you didn't find that as, as, as much as you may today. 
so it was just, it was awesome. I continued having an agent for a while, and um, but it really was that stepping stone that I was looking for for a lifetime career. Well, that's really interesting because, you know, you're not what we would consider a, a legacy pageant girl. It wasn't, you know, a big part of your life. You you, you competed for the re- reasons that you just spoke about. So I guess going in mm-hmm. as somebody who's just like, you know, I want to do this for the opportunities and all that kind of stuff. What was your mindset mm-hmm. as you kind of, you know, approach the national show after Massachusetts? You know, because I've had a couple of national winners on uh, who have never competed before. They actually won the crown. A couple of weeks right. ago, I had Catherine Hike on, who was Miss Teen USA uh, 2015. It seems like... For those of you who are, I guess we'll call you raw, you know, you're not pageant coached. It mm-hmm. actually helps quite a bit. Right. I was, you know, a wrench to the system. I always say that because I watch my pageant back and go, how the heck did I win? My husband <laughs> and I talked about it all the time. <laughs> what happened? I didn't say anything. I mean, they asked me one question, you know, it, what was it? Uh, tell us why you should be Miss USA without saying a word, you know, and the producers read me like a book because everything I've done in my life was physical. I was a personal trainer on a show and they wanted me to exercise in some way. You know, I couldn't do cartwheels or, you know, do push ups in my dress, but they were, they would, they would have liked that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, so I was an absolute wrench to the system. So going into it, I was surprised. I, I wondered if they were going to want me. And that was, I was scared to death about that. I got there and I thought, you know what? I am not this mold. I am, I, you know, but, but I did. My hair got bigger. My makeup got heavier as I went on those three weeks. I mean, I, I went there with barely enough clothing to wear, Tim. I mean, I had a trunk full of clothes, <laughs> enough to be on at night. And, uh, you know, love to have a, a cocktail stuff at night. I was switching scarves by day, you know, just try, hoping just to make do. It's not what you have to have. And, you know, I try to tell the girls, yes, it's nice to be dressed in Fendi head to toe when you come out of that room. But you don't have to be to win this pageant. You know, you need to look put together and you need to feel confident about yourself and you need to know what's going on on stage. That's what I had to my advantage. So I felt comfortable in the, you know, in the television realm and just being myself. But the pageant world, I was very apprehensive. That's why I think I was more hesitant on, gosh, what do I say? Because everybody's so rehearsed and, and plans every night on what they need to say. You know, you just need to form opinions on things and not be so frightened of right or wrong. You can actually be okay with not knowing how you feel in a certain position as long as you're confident saying, I just don't know how I feel about that right now. <laughs> you know? that, yeah, um, and that's really and interesting I, because let, let go, go into the judges' room, okay? Go back to 1998. What yeah. was it like, I guess, from a yeah. chemistry standpoint with you and the judges? Because as you said, everybody goes in very rehearsed, especially at that time. And you kind of go in as this yeah. uh, you know, fitness coach from a television show and you're like, hey, how's it going? Yeah, that's exactly what I did. Hey, you know, I think being down to earth is what was so refreshing for them. They were ready to start a new phase in the pageant world, and they didn't want that mold anymore. Trump came in and said, I don't want sequins all over. You know, but now sequins is back, which is interesting. All that 80s hair and sequins is so fun to watch. The, the decades changed, but back then it was like, no, we are going to Nine West Shoes. We're getting away from shoulder pads and sequins, and we are going New York and Los Angeles style, you know, so... I went in that, to that mindset of just be myself, and I got a little more insecure as I went on, thinking that that's what they wanted was the mold and that it wasn't going to be me. And fortunately, I just, I, you know, I happened to nail it with, with uh, you know, swimwear, which was great because that was my forte. Even God, I think it was just a, a presence that you have. when If you command a presence and not demand it, you know, you walk out and you just feel it then uh, that's what takes them. And I was really lucky, both both of those competitions at the same time. I think they loved me all along, and then if, if I didn't fall on my face at the end, they were going to keep me. And that was, <laughs> that's, you know, uh, that was a dynamic of mine was really wasn't so uh, up till the final question. It was really, I think they kind of decided all along, like, oh, she's so fresh, she's this and that. Because, you know what, Sh- um, Shauna Gamble was a Miss Teen USA. And she would have been the first to do how to win both of those at that time, to be a Miss Teen and a Miss USA. And she was perfect, absolutely perfect. Um, I, I don't think she could have answered anything differently. I don't think she could have looked any better or presented herself in any different way. She was fantastic. And, you know, I would looked and sounded a little less prepared, a little less perfect. Um, and my imperfection is what really, I think, made me tangible. It made me approachable. And uh, I could go into hospitals and talk to sick children and set the crown down and walk over. I had kids tell me, Tim, why are you here with, like, your 15 shades of eyeshadow and all your makeup and come in when I'm dying and puking? You know, what? and <clears throat> that's what we're faced. I mean, I ended up not wearing dresses back then. I wore pantsuits and a sweater set. 
I wore the, ba- uh, the I wore the sash, but I did not wear my crown. You know, Miss Universe has a lot more elegant, um, you know, appearances, I think, than we did back then. Now things are totally different. But for us at that time, being down to earth and tangible just seemed to work. And imperfection, if you will. So were you shocked that you, you know, made top five and one? Well, I was hoping that they wanted something like that. I was hoping that, you know, I didn't fall on my face. I didn't say anything completely, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I just thought, I think I would be a wrench, but I know I love people. I know I can relate to people. That's one thing I think in the interview is, that, wow, she's so down to earth. I mean, how could you not want to just talk to this person when you just sit down and have a conversation? I love people. <clears throat> I love to communicate with people, and I love being raw and open and down to earth because it makes them feel comfortable sharing themselves right back. And that's what I think Miss USA, if you're not tangible and you are, you know, walking in and a, a child is intimidated by you, that's, yes, we can be in awe that you're like Elsa, which our current one is so beautiful in that way, but she's still so, you know, down to earth. You feel like you can go up and talk to her. And that's what's really cool about it. Well, I went back and watched your top five question this morning and, uh, yeah, you were. You were just very natural. It was just. It was very conversational, which you just don't see a lot, quite quite frankly, in the top five. So that was nice to see. Now, uh, I have a blast from the past for you. Um, I have been texting back and forth <laughs> the last few minutes with your uh, Miss Massachusetts sis, Susie Castillo, and I was. Uh, Susie! Yeah, I, I said, "Do you want me to ask her anything?" And she said, "Ask her if she remembers." Her question, because she remembers watching you at Miss USA in 1998, and then five years later, of course, she goes uh-huh. on to win. But she actually had the same, or, or pretty much, you know, verbatim, the same question that you had. Did you know that? No. Are you kidding me? That's, that's <laughs> hilarious. I remember it. I remember it. If you could put three things in a time millennium capsule to be opened up, I think, a thousand years later or some time frame, what would it be? And right. I answered so from the heart because we were over an ice rink. Okay, Tim. So there was still <laughs> ice underneath. The, the 5,000 people that were there, which now they, I mean, back then, Susie knows, we packed the places back then. Um, and they were freezing. We were all freezing. Um, and I remember saying my flannel sheets thinking, oh, gosh, everyone at home has no idea what that means. <laughs> um, but I lived in Boston, and Susie knows that. <laughs> she, uh, but sometimes you just answer the way you feel in a certain, you know, atmosphere. And I, yeah, and then something feminine, they turned it into that, because I'm looking down at Frederick, who was a Victoria's Secret model. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking kind of like, put some something feminine. I didn't say underwear. I didn't say lingerie. I said something feminine, something feminine of the nineties or I don't know. And I'm thinking my dress or that like, so, and I'm looking at her like she's just laughing at me. <laughs> just great. Cause I, she's like, what do you want? And then, um, and I said, my laptop computer, something like that. But yeah. It, it was uh, just how I was feeling. You know, and again, Shauna Gam- or, uh, Shauna Gamble answered per- per- women's literature, um, CDs, how we've been, how women- music has you know gone. I think she said her laptop too, but so uh, yeah, it was just a little different. <laughs> well, that's cool. Uh, was it, it was, the press was conference it... was brutal, though. <laughs> the press conference was brutal. Yeah, they they, they roasted. They were down. thinking I said un- underwear, yeah, that or lingerie or something. So uh, it turned. I said, did I say that? <laughs> okay. Did it bring back some memories well, to watch the uh, Miss USA in Shreveport again this year? Oh, my goodness. Well, I just went back to the 20th anniversary and saw Vanessa and, and had a reunion. Um, yeah, I went back to Shreveport and it was very emotional. Uh, we, I mean, we packed that place and um, it was just so much fun. Yeah, it brought up a lot. Seeing Vanessa again, you know, we were very close to Los Angeles for about 10 years. And I've moved, uh, I've moved out to Denver 10 years ago. But, you know, it was so great to see her now raising children that are my age. I had children a lot later. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, it was uh, very emotional. You saw that on social media. Um, Travis, one of our one of our friends on uh, on Facebook, he he captured the moment of us hugging, and because I didn't want to bug her, you know, and and come find sure. her. But we ended up just intersecting at one point, and she walked by me with Nick, and they were going back to the stage, and she didn't even recognize me because my hair's you know brunette, and I was blonde back then. But we just had a moment of tears, and it was uh, it was heartfelt. That's super cool to hear. That's super cool to hear. Well, I, I want to go back a little bit to, to your uh, education. So you graduated cum laude from Jacksonville University. Um, you had a BA in broadcasting and telecommunications, a minor in business law, uh, but you did go there on an athletic scholarship. I know you mentioned it a little bit earlier. So, what uh, sport did you play collegiately? I played. Oh, I started as, actually at a young life doing all sorts of um, competitive sports. I started figure skating when I was eight. Um, I was fourth in the nation in figure skating. Um, then I went on to play volleyball in high school in Alvin, California. I played with, with these girls that went on to full rides in Stanford. I mean, we have enough progressive <clears throat> coach 
who was feeding us tofu and we were playing on the beach. I mean, it was just <laughs> unbelievable. He was a, he was a psychology teacher. Um, it, it was just very progressive. So I played with these amazing women and it, it gave me the honor to go back east to Florida and actually um, get partial scholarship for a division one school. So I played uh, volleyball. I dove in high school, um, ran track, um, I danced. And that's what kind of inspired me to keep into the athleticism was become a personal trainer at the end of my collegiate um, education. I just wanted to stay in the fitness world. I was already feeling this letdown of, oh my gosh, when I graduate, what am I going to do? I've been athletic my entire life. You know, I, I golf and I play tennis for fun, but I really wanted to sustain that sort of lifestyle and somehow intertwine that in, in television because I figured out at the end that hard news was not right for me. I'm very emotional, Tim. Mm-hmm. I'm, very, <laughs> you know, I'm very raw. As we talked about, I'm very down to earth and it was hard for me to think about doing anchoring um, hard news at that point and reporting it. So I went towards more fluff. And then I realized at the end of 10 years of that, am I aspiring to entertainment tonight and extra? And I realized that was a different motivation for me as well. I didn't want to ask someone, how are you, who are you dating and what are you wearing? And it just wasn't necessarily um, what I was looking for. But I found some great gigs along the way that were significant and fed the soul as well. Well, you definitely carried the personal training into, uh, you know, into television like you talked about. So as we mentioned earlier, you had a stint on ESPN2. Um, the show was called Co-Ed Training. And then I personally in high school remember watching those shows. You were on uh, – you made a lot of cameos on Body Shaping as well. Um, and for those of yeah. you who don't know what those shows are back in those days, these were basically good-looking people working out on TV for an hour. So <laughs> tell everybody how you got involved in something <laughs> On like the that. beach. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. On the beach in Jamaica or Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, we were working out uh, in the sand, 100-degree um, weather, 99% humidity with 1,000-watt uh, lights on us. Uh, we did five shows a day. 10 minute segments. They were half hour shows. Our tongue was falling out of our mouth by the end of the day. We were so, I had to dry my hair <clears throat> before I started each segment. It was, it was the most incredible experience I've ever had starting in television. And <clears throat> because we wrote our own shows and we actually were, our producer, we were like the friends of fitness. He got this team together. I was more of your kind of your jock from the college. We had our bodybuilding specialist, our martial, martial arts specialist, our aerobics and yoga. <clears throat> and it was just fantastic that he let us do our thing. I mean, it was ready, set, go. We had the camera signs and we were spontaneous. And we just went through certain exercises and we had a, a theme of the show. And it was really a great way to learn spontaneity. Um, later on in my career in direct TV, everything was teleprompted and written for you. And, you know, producers, if you said the or what's wrong, it was cut, you know. So it was such an interesting experience for the first five years to be that um, spontaneous and, you know, just just speaking the way you would speak with people that you get along with and exercise. It was so much fun. Well, these were this was back in the days of, you know, like Baywatch was starting to become big. Was it weird to be on television and, you know, <laughs> really, you, I mean, I think many times you were in a two-piece working out with, you know, bodybuilders that were wearing these tiny little shorts. Was, <laughs> it, was that weird for you or was it like, you know, this is the new thing? <clears throat> you know what? Well, I, coming from California, I surfed before I went to high school in the morning. Um, I pretty much grew up in Newport Beach in a swimsuit on a bike. I mean, I... I, I swam before I walked, so I've pretty much been in a in swimsuit my whole life, but um, when it comes to when you were objectified a little bit, yes, it was different for me, and that's when I realized um, at the end of my reign as well, uh, I was already working in that sort of venue, and I had the opportunity with Hugh Hefner. Um, I, would be, I would have been the first one, the first Miss USA to be in Playboy, <clears throat> and they, uh, they offered me that, and I had just gotten my new direct TV contract, making more than the offer would have been. Um, with uh, Playboy, and it, that was the turning point right then. Am I going to continue this sort of body thing and, you know, go the Shane and Mopo direction, go, um, but she has got that Pamela Anderson thing. You know, I, I'm not that, as, as beautiful necessarily on camera. I'm not as photogenic. I wasn't the, the most beautiful on stage at Miss USA. I, I completely felt comfortable saying that. Um, I think it was my inner beauty, which I really love, and, and, and just who I am as a person, and all of it kind of coming together is what worked. Um, you got to know your angles. You got to know what's, you know, I, I look back on my hair too, just wishing I had a pick or something to comb my hair out back then. Like, what? <laughs> it was just this helmet head. You know, there's so many things when you look back, you wish you would have done differently. But, um, you know, it, it, I kind of got off on a, on a thing there. But um, I, it wasn't my direction. You know, I didn't want to go further in the body. So fitness and, and that was enough. Um, and I felt comfortable in that realm. 
and she, and then I also did the prices right for almost a year. I mean, trust me, they had me in a swimsuit every day. I mean, I was the one by the hot tub constantly, you know. So um, I was comfortable on that, but taking it a step further, I realized I wanted something more conservative. I wanted something more significant, and that's when I started losing my hearing. Um, I realized that the Los Angeles market wasn't necessarily working for me anymore, and I had to, to change and evolve into the next person I was going to be for the rest of my career. Well, you mentioned the Price is Right. So you were a what they call a Barker beauty back when Bob Barker still hosted the show. It was a huge show back then. Uh, bar, uh, being a Barker beauty was a big deal. Um, how did you get yeah, that well, job? Was and, so much yeah, <laughs> what, what was it like? Well, it was amazing. You know, that was kind of on the cusp of losing my hearing. So it was frustrating at times, too, because I know they were frustrated with me and, and certain things that it's hard to it's hard to admit. Back then, you don't want to disclose those things to people. Um, that sort of imperfection you were in fear of because technology was nothing of what it is today. So I wasn't able to get along as well as I am now. But um, it was it was awesome, you know. <laughs> And Barker was, was fantastic to me. He was uh, completely appropriate. And Brandy Sherwood, actually, who crowned me Miss USA, she was on there for quite a bit of time um, as a Barker girl. And we just had so much fun. You know, you're just bouncing around and these products. And uh, I didn't have to talk, which I thought was a challenge. You know, it was amazing. <laughs> I get to show up. And you just walk around and wave at people, and it's a great gig. I was still waitressing at night. I mean, you guys, when you're in Los Angeles and you book a – you know, this was actually not a contract. You're going week by week. And um, back then, that's when the girls, they let go of the contracts because some of them were very, were getting very um, – how can you say? It was very family. Things crossed over a little bit too much, and they were being expectant on their career to continue there when – you know, gigs are gigs in LA. You're lucky if you get a year or two contract and, you know, sustain that, but it's pretty much out with the old and with the new. So whatever you make, you've got to save it and prepare for auditioning for a time frame. And, you know, that's what I had with direct TV, but uh, yeah, so it was just week to week, but it was so much fun that I was, I was way too sitting at a sushi joint at night, despite that I was making 1200, you know, whatever I was making that week, I still was, you know, in survival mode when you're taking care of yourself. And that's what I was doing. What was it like to be kind of a, you know, it's, you're, you're kind of like a Vanna White, you know, you're, you're using your arms and, you know, here it is. And what was it like just to kind of be that personality where you, you don't get to speak and you just smile? <laughs> you know what? It's, it's funny that you say that because you're right. People look at it this, as this, you know, magnanimous. Uh, yeah, Vanna, she did sustain a contract for a very long time. So, you know, I wouldn't necessarily compare us to Vanna. Uh, she is exceptional. Um, but there are a few that have done really well. But I still consider myself just like everybody else. You know, I think when you finish The Crown and I came into it with television experience, um, I felt special, but I still was always worried about that next gig or, you know, I didn't feel like I was going to be defined as a Barker girl or, you know, it was like, hey, this is fun. This is fun to pay the bills for now. Honestly, and that's being completely authentic that, okay, how long is this going to last? But I got to keep, you're still auditioning whenever you can and looking for that next gig. So it was a breath of fresh air is what I can say to have your bills paid and to be able to get up there and just have fun and not have that dialogue, but it certainly wasn't something that was going to challenge my intellect or advance my career in, in, in speaking my voice. So you know what I'm saying? It wasn't necessarily going to make me in another way that maybe the pageant had helped with, but I, you know what it goes back to, Tim, my fitness show, people can say, oh yeah, you're Miss USA or you were, but I remember you on college training, you know, after 20 years, that five-year gig has sustained, you know, notoriety, if you will, more than the pageant ever did, but I still have um, a wonderful pageant community that reaches out to me that I'm very blessed and grateful for. What was it like to work with with Bob? I actually had a chance to interview him about 10, 11 years ago, and he seemed like just a a hilarious guy. He seemed very quick-witted. Was it fun to work with him? Oh, yeah. You know, this was towards the end of his career. He, to be honest, I think because everything that happened with um, a relationship with one of the former, you know, one of the former girls, Mm -hmm. he, he kept his distance with us, Jim. So, it, um, he would come on and be, you know, do his thing and we did our thing. So, um, you know, I think Drew is just amazing taking that, that step in. He is fantastic, but we really didn't have a tight connection with, with, um, Bob. So we just saw him very casually. And I think it was more of him to protect himself that the girls were getting, um, attached. 
Um, sure. So I, I didn't get to, to, uh, to experience a close relationship with him. Yeah. But he did great. You know, he's been doing it for so long. He's a professional, and he nailed everything. And, you know, um, it was just an honor to work with him because he was very professional, and yeah. I appreciated that. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Well, let's talk about some of the more serious things in your life. As you have mentioned throughout this podcast, it's probably one of the, the biggest thing, if not the biggest thing in your life that you deal with. You were diagnosed with a rare form of Meniere's disease 20 years ago. Um, Now, for those who are not familiar with Meniere's, can you kind of describe um, what it is and how it affects your life? Absolutely. So um, towards the end of my reign, I I was traveling 20,000 miles a month, up and down, congested. I still have horrible allergies. Um, I started realizing I was having ringing and buzzing of the ears, which actually one in nine people have symptoms of Meniere's and don't even realize it. But the tinnitus or tinnitus, people call it the ringing of the ears. I had fullness. I was losing some hearing in my left ear, um, my right. Was, it was still unclear. So I was, uh, I was pretty frightened. I went to the house ear clinic to figure out what's going on. They did MRIs to see if there was any tumors growing or something happening. Once I was cleared of that, they just said, treat your symptoms. And I went, well, what does that mean? Am I going to lose this completely? I mean, I was scared to death. I wasn't able to audition as well and understand people from 30 feet away when the head was behind the camera. I wasn't able to um, continue working the way that I was. It, it, it became very prevalent that I needed to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And losing your hearing and in the business, I was actually stumbling on my, how I was speaking because I wasn't hearing myself. So um, it was frightening. So I got hearing aids immediately and realized that was what I needed to at least keep my eardrums going. And I didn't know what that meant because it is a muscle. And if you don't exercise them, you will create atrophy just like you do your body. So I got the hearing aids to make sure that I could still identify with sound before I lost it. And I could still enunciate the way that I needed to, to, to communicate, you know, trying to figure out how I was going to survive and focusing on television in that industry for so long was very difficult, but um, I still did okay. And I went back to school. I mean, for me, keeping my head afloat was more education. I've been halfway through a nursing degree for almost 10 years, but I had to put a hold on it because my children uh, cost us uh, an Ivy league education because we did in vitro fertilization for that. So, um, I uh, just had to deal with the symptoms, which are the, all, the ones that I told you. I have water retention as well, which when I eat high salt, I gain water weight, and then I don't hear as clear. So, you know, when, you, when you're diagnosed with a disease, you're like, what, what does this mean? <laughs> you know, okay, am I going to die? Or what, what is, you know, so I was basically on the onset. I didn't have the heavy vertigo, which most people connect uh, Meniere's with. This was the big confusion with my rare form, because I had certain symptoms that were not as typical for Meniere's. The vertigo, the, after the first two years, the tinnitus sub- subsided and my hearing loss became more prevalent. So that's the, where the rare form is. Only a, a few percent have the bilir- bilateral hearing loss at age 27, the way that I did. So um, I just had to, like I said, treat the symptoms. I got on a diuretic, I did allergy shots, got my hearing aids and was waiting for whatever my destiny was gonna be hearing loss completely, vertigo episodes. I had no idea how severe everything was going to change. And um, so I just kind of dealt with it. And that's where I was with that. It was challenging. Well, I tell you, I mean, it's from just the way you explain it, I mean, it sounds like you handled it very positively, which I think a lot of people, you know, they would go into a depression or, you know, like, is my life ever going to be the same? How did you, I guess, psychologically handle things those first few years? Oh, did I seem like I was just fine? That's that's great. <laughs> it, did, well, it did, yeah, it sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I can say I can say talk about that 20 years later because, you know, facing another adversity, which we'll get into it. Um, you know, I didn't. I, I was in denial, I think, at first, Tim. So that I was in denial. I didn't want to talk about I I thought there are kids dying out there. You know, who am I to, you know, have a pity party? And I still say that now. What is who? who you know, I'm, I'm fine. So I really didn't want to talk about it. It just kind of pushed it under the rug. No big deal. No big deal. Fine. You know, but I did suppress a lot of feelings, I think, that came out later of not being good enough. And, you know, things that you've talked about, taking at hand, being at hand, dealing with those things at hand. And when you suppress that sort of stuff, it will come out in a big way. And um, you hit that on the head. So what happened is I, I did, I got a little overbearing, I think of my circle of friends and my family. Cause I've missed having that voice to keep us in conversations around me. I mean, I was depressed. I would go through ups and downs of new technology, trying different things and realize I'm not getting along. Now I'm just talking. And everyone's like, we talked about that 10 minutes ago, you know, Shanae. And I was, was isolated. Um, I felt very alone. Um, 
I, especially in Los Angeles, Tim, it's not the easiest town. If you slow down, <laughs> you are out. Not at all. I mean, you know, so I had a handful of friends that were like, Shana, you didn't, you didn't hear that right. Let, let me tell you what, what they're saying. And that really cared about me. And I realized um, reaching out to my community is what I needed to do. I reached out to Siemens for new technology, and that was over 10 years ago. Um, and I asked them for help. I said, I'm on my own. I can't afford this technology. Can I do anything for you? Testimonials, can I, you know, commercials, anything um, to try new technology that's going to help me evolve because I'm stuck. I'm literally stuck. I can't even educate myself in a classroom without trying to keep up with notes. And I was still not ready to disclose things back then um, because I can get notes transcribed now. I can have everything given to me. But back then, I didn't want to. I was stubborn. I was an honor student. I, I, you know, going back to nursing classes, it was science. It was totally different. I had to redo all of my sciences from the, from the get-go. And um, I didn't want to ask, to ask for help. You know, I, I felt like I was being weak asking for transcribed notes, but now it's the norm, you know. So I encourage everyone that needs help in any sort of disability to stand up and ask for your rights and don't hold back because you will get stuck and you will not evolve. And that's what I was doing. And Siemens opened up an entire new community and world to me with open arms. And they saw me for who I was and they wanted me to be me everywhere around the world. So I traveled to 12 countries a year. Um, you name it. It gets me choked up thinking about it, that I modeled in catalogs for them commercials. I would show up at, at international trade shows with 40 countries around the world, and Siemens would just send me up there and just say, just talk just to you. <laughs> well, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to talk about to these guys? They all just travel, one, men and women from all over the world. They can barely keep their eyes open, and they wanted me to just stand up and talk a little bit. So I just aired it all out. I told them I was stuck. I couldn't evolve. Um, I, didn't, I couldn't keep up in conversations, and Siemens saved me. I mean, they saved my soul along with, with faith, um, and they opened my, their community and their hearts to me and technology to me and kept me afloat in times where I felt lost. So, um, you know, not to sound that I wasn't okay. I was okay, but I aired it all out, and they love the emotional side. Germans are a little tougher. Okay, they're not quite the criers. Like, <laughs> you know, so uh, they like that I, <laughs> that I did, but Jim, they actually had me host one of their shows one time, which I had not, had not done for quite a while, that they said, just get up and be you, be that emotional you, you know, and I went, what? You know, but if I came up with that strong Tim voice, you know, but I did, but then I still brought that emotional down to earth, a softer, you know, side. And that's what they really loved about it. And I'm just, I was so blessed and just honored again. So that was a little bit of that journey. So you were the spokesperson, I believe it was the, the Siemens Pure 700 hearing aid, I guess at that time. Yeah. Um, for those, you know, who don't deal with hearing issues and they want to understand exactly mm. how these hearing aids work, can you kind of explain what it did for you? Yeah. Um, well, back when Siemens uh, technology was taking a turn and they responded to me and said, hey, just try the technology. Everything was going to Bluetooth. So it was all in your head and you could answer the phone and you had this apparatus, you could listen to the TV. I mean, it was mind blowing. And they told me, Shanae, this is going to change your life. Just wear them for a while. And I kept saying, what can I do for you? But it took about six to eight months and my brain just Boom. I mean, and that's what it takes for new technology. And I encourage everyone as an, an advocate for early detection of hearing loss, you need to get them in as soon as possible, because if you lose sound, it's going to be too much for you. And you see people, and especially in the elderly community, that put hearing aids in for the first time when they have let sound go for a long time. They don't want to hear all that. They don't, they don't know how to adjust to that new way of hearing. So that's why it's important when you are losing your hearing initially to get technology in your head so you become, you adjust. And every three to five years, there'd be a turn in technology. And I try the new, the new apparatus. My husband would say, all right, I'm not noticing this much. And he's like, you just kind of sound, it's kind of normal to me now. And I just had this light bulb go off and he thought I was normal. I just, that's it. That's all we want to be is normal. You know, I, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't even know what perfect hearing was anymore. I just wanted to be normal and get, get along with everyone. So when technology made this turn, um, you can, you have everything digital and you could, now we have apps on our phone. Um, it's just unbelievable, but to how to be able to listen to the telephone in both ears. So it changed my life in ways of communication that a lot with hearing impaired, you can't talk on the phone that well, at least I couldn't, it was getting that severe and that changes your whole way of working, obviously. So it was just an amazing experience to be offered that opportunity to go there. And they just wanted me to listen to it for a while and then just talk about it. So it was, it was very authentic. And, uh, you know, what's funny, Tim, they, they actually 
brought me out to um, to Germany the first time. It was supposed, that first commercial, the Pure commercial, was my coming out as hearing impaired, and they were app- apprehensive that I wanted to do that. You know, um, they flew me in and said that we're just doing a day rate and so forth. But then they presented me with this contract and they said, "We're going to spend a quarter of a million on a commercial with you. Um, what do you think about that? This is your you're coming out <laughs> as Miss USA." And I just was like, uh, "Excuse me." <laughs> Wow. Pardon me? You know, and so they just call it a shooting. Would you like a shooting? You know, and so that's what I did with them for 10 years. I could travel 23 hours and do a shooting for a Cadillac, or I could be in the corner of an office room doing a testimonial, um, or I could be, you know, shooting with, gosh, there's 50, 50 extras, and, and the next, the last pier one I just did uh, in the subway, we closed down the subway in, um, in Serbia. And this is when all of the um, immigrants were coming through and we shut it down in the middle of the night. We worked 48 hours straight, straight. We had maybe three to five hours in between to go back and rest and come back on set in the middle of the night. And um, I had fill-ins that were there, like hundreds of extras. And it was unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. And I never know. I just, this is after the kids, I just showed up like, okay, what are we doing? And they're like, well, here, there's some, this one doesn't have that much script, but we just need you to, to do this. And I'm like, gosh, you guys are amazing. I mean, you know, and they sent me home with your technology and I'm just uh, – I feel closer to God when I'm with that company, well, and I mean, they're now they're now their name is Signia. Signia is their uh, Siemens was uh, was bought out by Signia Hearing, and uh, that was my last venture was with them. I mean, how crazy is it to think that hearing being hearing impaired actually brought more opportunities than took them away? And that that's the whole thing, you know, when you just leave it up to to your your higher power and you think about your direction and what your calling is. And that's why I'm working with uh, what I'm doing right now with my charity. Um, and we'll get into that. But yeah, it, it made me feel closer to God. They loved me for who I was. And I didn't think about those imperfections and what I didn't have. It was what I did have and what I could have. And people that loved me just the way I was. Well, I love that your faith is a big part of this, and it certainly helped carry you through it uh, along with that company. Now, for those listening, they're probably going, gosh, John, A sounds normal. I mean, it doesn't sound like there's any issues at all. So I explain to people, like, for instance, we talked yesterday, what you have to do just in order to do this phone call with me. How, how do you set up? Okay, so I have a, a check that I wear around my neck, and what that does is it syncs my phone into my hearing aid which is unbelievable. So I can hear in both of them. And um, it just allows me to, commu- you know, to communicate, which uh, I lost for quite, a, quite some time. So I have to plug it in, make sure my check is, you know, my husband doesn't take the charger and I'm plugging in my charger and then all of a sudden I can't talk on the phone. You know, that could have happened this morning, but, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, I got to prepare with my apparatus, but I have my phone. Now, if I did have an iPhone, though, we can sync directly uh, with Signia from the iPhone to my headset and I don't need my tech anymore, but I'm still, I'm still on the Samsung and that should probably happen with over, over the year. But for now, I have a little necklace that I wear and that's kind of my, I'm a latchkey kid. I used to joke about that. <laughs> that's my... <laughs> That's my lifeline. My lifeline to communication, and uh, I'm proud to wear it. So, but it's kind of a cool looking thing. We used to have bigger ones, like our old cell phones, you know, sure. with big old buttons on it. And uh, now it's a, a sleek apparatus. But now it's, we're going to be, a, we're going to alleviate that pretty soon. Yeah. So that's, that's my setup for the, for the day. Well, it's so cool that, you know, you're just able to do this. And, and really, it, it, honestly, I w- I w- if you didn't tell me, I wouldn't have any idea. And that's, I think that's the really cool thing about it. That, that means a lot. It's fun. It's fun to be able to be normal, to be well, in the hearing world. And, and Siemens has kept me in the hearing world, for sure. Well, let's talk about your nonprofits. Now, uh, you and I are both residents of Denver, Colorado, and uh, you do some work out here uh, in, in this uh, realm. Um, we, we talked a little bit earlier in the beginning about uh, someone like you, and uh, you're the Rare Disease Ambassador for Colorado Rare 501c3. Can you talk about your involvement in those and just kind of where they're going? Absolutely. So I am the spokesperson for a company called Someone Like You, and that's some number one like you. And what we do is we connect people with health conditions, um, rare diseases, health conditions. We do it privately, though, and it's done through an email, no message board. Um, we've done that because I'm also an ambassador for Colorado Rare. We have about a half a million in Colorado with rare diseases. And my CEO and founder of Someone Like You, uh, Mikhail Allison, she basically has been struggling over the past seven years trying to figure out with her daughter what's, what's been going on. Um, when you have a rare disease, most of them aren't diagnosed until the age of six or seven on average. And, and little Lily is our hero, is seven. So they just found a diagnosis uh, this last year. 
And what gives me chills to say, I mean, she has something called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, EDS, and uh, we can get into those, you know, the symptoms, we, you guys can go online and, and figure that out, but it's a rare disease, and there is no cure for most rare diseases. 5% get medication. It's very frustrating. Um, not a lot of funding out there, and we just deal with the symptoms, and that's the challenging part. So connecting with Michaela, she was actually one of my instructors at my, um, from my skincare college that I actually am a sub-instructor at. Um, I am now a medically trained esthetic. I have been for 10 years. I work with the skin. It was something I was passionate about, being healthy and keeping that youthful, you know, glow, that working in television for years. So that's been kind of a side passion um, as I've been working on, on building a family. But someone like you, this is, is feeds the soul. It feeds the heart because of this rare disease and connecting others with health conditions privately when you feel alone. So I talked about that earlier, of being isolated and, and not feeling like anyone can understand you. That's what Lily felt, and Michaela understood that. And at one point, our little Lily asked her mom, I want to find someone like me who, who's out there. And that, you know, stimulated Michaela for her initiative to, to start this someone like you to connect people. So it could be for individuals, um, especially children, teenagers, or even adults that feel alone in whatever process they're going through. And that's why we, we don't just want to say it's rare disease focused. We opened it up to health conditions. So people can just identify with other people if that disease is that rare. How about someone that's understanding being paralyzed in a wheelchair and going through the pain of rehabilitation together? Um, it, you know, those sort of things are significant when someone wants to, to connect with someone. So I have been so proud to be a part of that. We just recently signed um, on with Allstate. Uh, we are also the Vonda McDonald House is one of our sponsors. We have two of our girls that are community ambassadors. Emma and Audrey are ICE girls for Avalanche, which is also one of our sponsors. Yeah. Um, we have Allstate, what I, what I said, uh, Ronald McDonald House and um, yeah, the ICE girls. So they're amazing. They're in college, pre-med, just the most intelligent young women working for my boss, Michaela, who is just the most exceptional person I think I've met in a really long time. These girls are just driving this force of an LQC, which is a high Hybrid. Um, it is profit and for nonprofit. We're trying to raise money for people, and we have an initiative called Be Kind going on right now. That we are going to be at all all state uh, doing an Oktoberfest locally in Denver. But Be Kind is, is an initiative. We have necklaces and we have hats to um, to stimulate people to be involved in community to help sponsor some of our memberships. So people can come together and, and meet if you buy this apparel. And, it, uh, you know, they could be lifetime memberships or just can be con contribution to memberships, a scholarship for certain memberships for different, um, different people out there that need each other. So that's what our initiative is now is these Be Kind, and we're getting them out in, in boutiques, and we're, we're selling our, our apparel. We have decals now. We have all this fun stuff. And all of it goes to help people connect, which is part of what we do, obviously. You know, I think it's been that so much fun. there's some synergy here with a, a former Miss USA. I don't know if you know her or not, Lou Parker, who was Miss USA 94. Um, she actually owns a company called Be Kind & Co. And it's all about basically you're like what you're oh. talking about. I think you, I should connect you two because I think there's some synergy there that could, that could definitely be uh, advantageous to the, to the program. Wonderful. Yeah, I'll get that information from you. I'd love to. love to meet her and introduce her to, to Michaela, my boss. Yeah, well, I, yeah I, it's, I, it's, a, it's a, something everyone wants to be a part of. Well, look, I love your heart, um, you know, that you've kind of just really let loose since this has all happened to you and you do so much to help others. And I know that you, you know, it's been a struggle. And you and I talked a little bit yesterday, um, the, the fact that you're so open about it and that you're willing to share your story to help inspire others um, is huge. And now you're going through something else. Um, why don't you talk a little bit yeah. about it and, and kind of what's happening in your life right now? Okay. Well, I called Tim yesterday, you guys, because I did have an, another thing going on now. And I was just sad I, that my website is not live at the moment because I've had to change a bunch of things because of changes in my life. Um, I've been writing blogs about my hearing loss and I was um, had been stimulated to get a cochlear implant and become bionic. Woo, that's what I wanted. <laughs> um, to take the, the leap and put an apparatus in my head to get rid of this this. this on my left side that's so much more significant than my right. So we've been confused about that. And um, I thought, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm going to wear this bright pink, you know, um, apparatus on my head and do this. And, you know, so many children out there have benefited. Many, many people out there have 60 to 80 percent hearing after getting an implant. So this was my journey. I was this year. I was my 20th anniversary. I was going to take the leap and go bionic. So I had to go through a series of tests to to begin that. And uh, did that MRI again, which I did 20 years ago, and found out that I have a brain tumor. 
say hello to my little friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was just uh, uh, two weeks ago, I believe. So, um, whoa, trying to figure out what am I going to do with that? So that all of these unanswered questions over the years, again, um, stimulate the advocacy of early detection of hearing loss because I can go into that's what we did initially and then we treated the symptoms but now we're seeing a four millimeter um, tumor on my cochlear nerve on my left side we can't go in and cut it out because I will lose hearing completely if we do that on the left so we're waiting every six months to do an MRI um, to see how fast it's growing. So this first initial one will give us an idea of what symptoms I've been facing over the last year or two and if it's growing significantly where we do need to address it. Um, typically these tumors are benign and slow growing. So um, that's good news. So again, I'm gonna live. <laughs> um, it's not about chemo and you know, radiation unfortunately will be an option if it starts to grow to where it could compromise my brain function and obviously my hearing. But if I didn't get this MRI, I would, I would have just thought the hearing loss was what was happening. You know, degenerative hearing loss is what has been happening to me for 20 years. I would have never thought that. So I have Dr. Jenkins at um, Advanced Audiology in Colorado. I have to thank her um, for stimulating me to go for the cochlear because if I wouldn't have wanted to push on to a more significant technology, um, I would have lost function in my brain and my face. My entire left side of my face would have been my first symptom that is irreversible. So as of right now, we're just keeping a close eye on it. And now it explains the deafness in my left being more severe than my right. Now we understand I do have Meniere's disease, a terrible case of it in my right. Um, but I have a, a, a tumor on my left. So totally two different diagnoses on, on both sides of my head. And it, completely rare once again so I can you know go back to my rare um, advocates and talk to them about that so I have to redefine again everything I was going to be bionic I can't be bionic anymore but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding but that was just I really wanted to be bionic I thought it was going to change my life for the better so I'm kind of letting go of that and realizing how blessed I am that I, I'm I'm going to live I'm going to keep my facial expression in my left side I just completely uh, flabbergasted on how this path again, of early detection or trying to figure out things or moving forward has given me um, a chance to stay alive, you know, and, and keep my face. <laughs> well, look, that's, that's what it is, really. I, 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 as much as I hate to hear all this, I am just, I love your optimism. And, you know, for those of you listening, yeah. there, look, there's power in prayer. And, you know, we should all say a prayer for Shawnee and just, you know, the, the removal of this tumor and uh, just that she, you know, maintains good health, you know, for quite a few years to come. And uh, I appreciate you sharing that. I know that's a hard thing to share and, and to talk about. But uh, so is the is the brain tumor what's actually causing the, the hearing loss on that side of your, your head? Yes. And if that's what was shocking is my doctor said I actually questioned the diagnosis 20 years ago that the first MRI on that left side. And I just looked at him and I said, well, I haven't been, you know, the Meniere symptoms I have are, are not fluke. And he said, well, they're the same symptoms, basically. But, I, but this is this is the miracle. And this is what uh, is this divine intervention, because thank you for the prayers. Um, I have not had a significant vertigo my entire life. I don't understand. There is no explanation why I have not been dizzy, throwing up, and incapable of functioning. There's no question. There's, the doctors are in awe that I've had many years for this long and don't have vertigo, but I've had hearing loss, and the other symptoms have happened. But now to have a tumor on my left cochlear, he is... He said, we took your balance. I did a dizzy test like I was at an amusement park. It was pretty crazy. <laughs> but um, I, I do have balance issues on my left side, but I don't. I've had a little bit of vertigo this, this allergy season, and that's what's frightening is he thinks that we don't know how fast this tumor is growing, but it could have been there 20 years ago, and technology did not catch it because it was so small because it's only four millimeters right now. So that's. He says this could have been growing slowly over 20 years, but now it, maybe it's getting bigger. Something's happening. You're getting a little bit of vertigo because your allergies have changed. Moving to Colorado from California, um, I'm having you know a lot of uh, allergy symptoms, which which does create some of this. But I don't have the vertigo. I am sh in shock that I have mild dizziness, but it's nothing of what you can get with heavy heavy symptoms of veneers. So that's the miracle. The shock is that I have this tumor growing, and I don't have the major symptoms that I should be having with the tumor. So the thing is, all right, watch it, and then if we need to shrink it, we'll go in and do some radiation. 
um, that the damage is done. So anything that I do right now is not going to restore any hearing. And that's what, that's the emotional part for me as I was really having some hope for a little bit for something different. But now I'm just, wow, I want to keep whatever hearing I do have on that left side with the hearing aid, which is just openness. I have 8%. I have nothing and I can't understand anything. But I can hear when I'm driving in the car, the window down. I can hear that it's open. And that feels good to me in my head when I hear that. So I want to sustain anything I can. So my question is, yeah, when do I go in with radiation? What are the symptoms of radiation, which is actually slight paralysis in your face as well um, for a period of time, and you have to do rehabilitation and, and um, exercise those to get that back. So that's a whole there's a slew of things. My husband and I have been walking around talking on one side of your face. If this was on camera, it'd be really funny because we're, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing talking on one side of my face and shutting the left side down, um, just trying to, you know, be positive and uh, just be happy with what I have for now and, and I'll bring it on, you know, bring it on, whatever I've got. We'll just take it head on. Well, in terms of the diagnosis, I, and I know you mentioned the radiation part, if, if it gets too uh, big, did they give any other type of diagnosis in terms of, you know, s- foods or supplementation in order, you know, since it's so small, is, is it something that, you know, can be tackled that way uh, in any way? Uh, you know what? The, he's talked to me about some things, blood thinners, which is ironic. My, I have uh, cardiovascular issues in my family. That's why I've been very healthy my entire life. But I've been taking fish oil and a lot of um, my HDLs are off the charts. Um, but at baby aspirin and fish oil have been a part of my life for so long that he says there's some significant studies of blood thinners um, helping to suppress the tumor. So that's pretty interesting as well. I've been there, done that. I've been doing that for a long time. He goes, well, that might that might help to stay on, on your aspirin therapy. But no, that's, that's all he suggested. And just to watch it. And then if we need to zap it, um, it, that's what we'll have to do. Yeah, there's nothing. It's, I can't, I don't want to take it out. Brain surgery could be a six week recovery and I'll lose hearing completely in that left side. So it's just a waiting game to see how fast it's growing. If it's going to deafen me and cause brain function, you know, something in there. It's just trying to figure out that fine line before it gets to three centimeters, which you can no longer do radiation. Once it's larger than three centimeters, you have to go in and take it out. So right now I'm at four millimeters. I'm doing great when it comes to still tackling it with radiation. So we're just going to keep a close eye on it and uh, take that baby aspirin. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, look, we're certainly cheering for you, and you can guarantee you're going to be in our prayers, and I thank you for that. Now for your uh, 501c3s, your, your nonprofits, I, I want to help, and I know I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who would like to help. How can we either donate or, you know, be, be part of the, uh, that movement to help you uh, kind of spread the word? Well, helping people with, with health conditions connect is such a wonderful feeling, and we are involved in that initiative. And it's Be Kind if you go to our website, www.someone, the number one like you. We also call ourselves silly. And it's <laughs> someone like you at co, co.com. That's in Colorado. We have necklaces and we have hats and we We have all sorts of wonderful things that you can purchase that will go towards memberships for people out there to connect. And uh, that's really what we want to do is get people together to help others that have health conditions, not just the ones that are striving and feel isolated, but others out there can step in and say, hey, we'll help you. And um, that's really what we want to do. We want to help everyone come together just to connect so we don't feel alone and um, just to give in the community and to keep evolving and help everyone be their best potential. That's really what we want is for everyone to keep growing and to feel like they're not alone. And uh, we can do that. So with your help, we can all do it. Well, for those of you listening, I'll put a link down in the uh, description of this podcast so you can go straight to it if you want to. Uh, Shawna, look, you're an inspiration. I mean, uh, I love your story. Um, I, I hate to hear the, the last part of your story, but I just I love how optimistic you are and how you're helping out others through your pain. And uh, just, just a huge fan. And I'm really honored that you joined us today. Thank you so much, Tim. You know, I am just blessed to have you here, too. I'd love to maybe connect with you and do some things that you're working on and do any anything I can to help you as well and be a testimonial for you. You are fantastic. And you give me chills when we listen to your 60 second sound bites. You, <laughs> Thank you. You, you, you just you've got it. I mean, you, you've got it and you are an inspiration as well. And I'm honored that you reached out to me. We found each other and we're here in Colorado. Anything I can do for you, you just let me know. Yeah, well, absolutely. And we'll we'll grab lunch downtown or something someday. That'd be great. Sounds good. And uh, good luck to you and your daughter. So fun. (laughs) Thank you. I appreciate it, Shawnee. Nice to have you on. Thank you, everyone. Take care. That is today's episode. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. And do me a favor, subscribe to the podcast on Spotify or SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, the podcast app, Google Play, or you can just go to lifeafterthecrown.com. 
And if you're still involved in the pageant world and you're wondering, well, what does Life After the Crown look like for me? And how can I prepare for it? Well, download my free Life After the Crown Starter Guide. It's a quick read, about 35 pages. It gives you a great blueprint on how to start planning now and not waiting until it's all over. To get it, just go to timtialdo.com slash starter guide. And for weekly podcast updates, just follow me on Instagram at Tim Tialdo. Until next time, remember the words of Matthew 634. Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Have a great week, everybody. Have a great week, everybody.